Welcome and good afternoon, everyone. It is two o'clock on this Wednesday, and that means it's time for us to get started. My name is Randy Lober, Growth Marketing Manager here at Action Benefits, joined today by Chelsea Smith, Learning and Development Specialist here at Action Benefits, and together we make the uh, best team, the best training team at least, well, we'll qualify that a little bit, in the health insurance industry, or at least that's what our moms would tell us. Uh, Chelsea, before we get started with today, I want to give you a chance to say hi before we uh, launch off into our agenda. <laughs> hi, everyone. I'm Chelsea Smith. As Randy said, I'm Learning Development Specialist. I'm here to do some of the commentating alongside Randy as we talk to you guys about some of the new rules that are being proposed for the individual market um, for 2026. So glad you're here. Um, just sit back, relax, put any questions you have in the chat, and let's get talking about those new marketplace rules. Thank you for joining us here, Chelsea, and helping to uh, wrangle everything that's happening out in the background. Um, and let's go ahead and talk about why you're here today. We know you're taking some time out in a busy time of year in the middle of AEP and OEP and group renewals and oh my gosh, everything. Uh, but it's always important to keep in, you know, keep abreast of what's happening in this in the industry, especially with lawmaking and rules happening around you that impact your day to day life. So today we're talking about the CMS proposed rule uh, for marketplace agents in 2026, contract year 2026. Uh, so it would go into effect next OEP. And for a little bit of additional context here, if you're not familiar with the rulemaking process, how this generally goes is CMS takes a look at everything that's happened in the market uh, place over the past year or so. And in the mid to late fall of every year, they write a, a proposed rule. In that proposed rule are things they'd like to change, alter, uh, improve, enhance about the functioning of the individual uh, health insurance marketplace. And they give the public some time to comment on that before the rule becomes final and they put it into effect for the next contract year. In this case, again, we're looking at contract year 2026, so a little bit uh, down the road because 2025 uh, contract year rules are already in place, of course. So I want to give you a little bit of a heads up about what could be coming for you. This is kind of pretty fresh off the presses. And again, want to make sure you're well informed about what could be happening here in your industry. Generally, as these things tend to go, uh, the, the rules, the final rule tends to look a ton like the proposed rule. Um, so the way you could be working, the rules you could be working under in 2025 may look a lot like uh, these now, for 2026, rather, may look like a lot like what you're going to see here on the screen. So let's talk a little first about where we're going today. Three kind of big questions I want to answer. There's 278 pages to the final rule. Not going to make you read all of it, nor should you have to. Um, but I do want to kind of take, you know, distill it down to the key points and the three big questions. First, your health insurance agents. What in this rule is going to directly impact you in your role as an agent or a broker? Second, what will have a direct impact on your consumers and how they experience and pay for coverage? And finally, uh, what's going to have some more of those indirect impacts? What's going to impact plans and uh, the market more broadly that you might not see or feel right away, but it's sure happening around you uh, and may impact some operations either in Michigan or in other states you may be licensed and working in with us for. So let's start answering that first question and talking about what directly impacts you, health insurance agents and brokers here in this case. And the first thing we should talk about is increased compliance concerns for agents and brokers. And before we go forward, I want you to do me a quick favor. Uh, down in the middle of your screen, there's like this raise hand button, and I'd like you to hit that raise hand button if you've had a marketplace client uh, AOR'd from you in the past mm, two to three years or so uh, without you knowing. So it has some bad actor come in and stolen uh, some of your marketplace business in, in the past two or three years without you knowing. Go ahead and raise your hand if that is true for you. I want to get a good sense of what's happening for you here. It's never happened to me, and it wasn't me stealing people's business. <laughs> Good. I'm glad it has never happened to you. I do see that it's happened to about a third of the folks with us here today, if I'm doing a, a quick back and napkin math. Um, and here's the thing about those, a, those ARR, AORs, rather. Uh, they're not 
always intentional, right? They're not because the age, the consumer rather is actively seeking out another agent to work with. What's actually happening behind the scenes is a little bit of fraud, a little bit of hacking, a little bit of interfering with marketplace and government systems where bad actors are um, essentially changing at marketplace applications, stealing kind of consumers right from, from you and getting paid on it. I, you know, whether or not the consumer likes that plan, needs that plan that they might've put them in or otherwise. So in the uh, past year or so, CMS has gotten upwards of 200,000 complaints, uh, which is pretty significant considering the size of marketplace enrollments. You know, there's about 18 million folks in the marketplace uh, through last uh, OEP. So they want to take a look at how to limit that going forward. And here's some of the steps they're taking to do that. First thing they are going to do is if uh, they take, spend a lot of the rule reasserting their authority to, again, monitor for compliance uh, and says, yes, agents, brokers, we do have this legal authority to uh, look at you, make sure you are compliant with marketplace rules and make sure you're acting with that. They spend about like four pages just laying out their legal authority to do that. What's really important, though, is they are taking an approach to a lot of the, um, this approach to really zero in on some of those web brokers or e-brokers that are kind of working in the background in some shady circumstances to steal some clients from hardworking folks like yourselves. And what they, uh, they're doing in effect is saying that the lead agent, the agency principal, is responsible for all of their employees' actions, meaning if the employees uh, under that agency principal are the ones actually uh, going in there and improperly or fraudulently changing at the end on an application or improperly or fraudulently changing a consumer's plan, it's actually the agent, agent principal, in addition to the employee, they will come down on uh, with sanctions, including civil monetary uh, penalty, penalties, suspension or revocation of their marketplace access, and suspension or revocation of their exchange agreements. Um, so the marketplace access right is their access, the ability to access the portal uh, in itself, healthcare.gov. And that's like the, 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 the middle ground, the middle step they could take. But if they revoke that marketplace agreement or um, suspend that marketplace agreement, the agent is forbidden from writing any marketplace business. If they just take away your healthcare.gov access, you're able to still write marketplace business, but you're calling the marketplace every time you're making that app, uh, and, you know, with a three-way call or so on and so forth. So um, that's what they're coming out here. They're saying, lead agents, we're holding you responsible. Agency principals, we're holding you responsible for everyone under you and making sure that you're compliant with the laws here. Uh, and again, uh, they'll see audits, suspensions, and violations coming up uh, to help sit with that. So I want to talk a little bit about those monitoring audit triggers. We know those happen. Uh, CMS was very clear in this rule uh, to lay out what exactly it is they're going to do uh, in some order, right? That you can't know exactly how the sausage, sausage is made in this case because then you can get around the rules. But here's what some things there that they're looking for going forward. First of all, they made clear that they're going to step up their kind of mo monitoring efforts and select agencies uh, randomly for auditing. They also are going to take a look at their activity on the marketplace via either healthcare.gov or an EDE or enhanced direct enrollment pathway and see if that activity might suggest potential fraud or abuse in this case. So what are they going to be looking for? Uh, one of the biggest indicators that they identified in the rule that kind of lined up with someone that was being fraudulent was, or engaging in fraudulent activity was when you go to work on the marketplace, whether it's an EDE pathway or on healthcare.gov, you're doing what's called the person search. You're searching by first like, name, last name, address, uh, social security number, whatever, you know, some kind of PII to help you identify the consumer that you're looking for. What these fraudulent actors tend to do is they have the first name and uh, the first initial of the last name, or they try variations of the last name to try and find a back marching or matching marketplace application or a valid marketplace application and get in there and mess around with it. So if your marketplace person search history or their search history going forward shows lots of unsuccessful searches, they're 
putting in lots of things that don't return an actual marketplace applicant for them to work on, that could be a, a trigger for an audit or a closer look from CMS. Second thing they're gonna look for is applications with missing social security numbers. In fact, uh, next month, they're rolling out some changes to healthcare.gov that makes it a lot harder to submit an application without SSN. Um, some of the ju justification is because you know, even a lot of it, immigrants, people of you know, variety of immigration statuses do have SSNs through, um, you know, through the programs they might be working with. So they're going to look, be looking to see whether uh, really everyone you work with doesn't have a, doesn't have a valid SSN. Um, if you have a lot, a high a number of applications that don't have an SSN attached, that's going to be another indicator for fraud that might draw some scrutiny. Uh, for these bad actors in the marketplace that are changing apps and stealing your commissions. The other thing they'll take a look at is rapid application changes. Um, so how quickly or how often are you sub submitting marketplace application changes? Yeah, are you changing you know, the same application every day, right? Or is that application being changed every day? Or are you an agent uh, changing or is that agency changing up their marketplace applications at a course that seem or an unusual clip? All of those things are things that they'll be looking for here. Uh, but Chelsea, I know you had some things you wanted to add on here as well to put the agents' minds at ease. I just know when I first read this, I was like, oh my gosh, if I was the lead agent in my agency, I'd be like, let me do all the typing. <laughs> like You guys don't need to be accidentally typing the wrong thing. I don't think it's going to be as terrible and as scary as it sounds. Or maybe I just thought it was scarier than it really was. But um, I think, yeah, they're just looking for keeping those bad actors out there. And if you're in this webinar, I guarantee you're not a bad actor. And I know some of you aren't. And from looking at the attendance list, you guys aren't bad actors. So I wouldn't be too concerned about this one, just as long as you're, again, like not committing fraud or, you know, submitting all your apps with no social security number, you're probably going to be just fine. Yeah, uh, really, I think the highlight here is is for the, most of the folks, all the folks in this room here is that. CMS, the marketplace, is doing something about those folks that are stealing, you know, clients from you, stealing AOR from you. They're doing something about the folks uh, that are improperly putting your clients in plans they didn't ask for with doctors that aren't in network with, that don't cover their drugs. So uh, this is a welcome step, I think, in many pe people's eyes uh, to uh, crack down on some of that activity. Second big thing that impacts you as agents is uh, this little dandy. Uh, what you have on the right side of your screen is a CMS model consent form for marketplace agents and brokers. In uh, contract year 2024, C uh, CMS put out this uh, document, right? that says you as the agent, as broker, agent or broker needs to obtain consent from a consumer before you even uh, do any a person search on a marketplace or before you conduct any enrollments. Uh, you know, they, they want to make sure that the consumer knows they have consented to appoint you as their agent of record uh, working on this application, and they have required you to document that. As part of that rule, um, or as part of that notice, they also required you to document every time that you change an application or that you submit a new application, that the consumer had a chance to review all that information and uh, it's accurate when you input it on the consumer's behalf. CMS, in their infinite wisdom, did give you a model form for that first piece, the consent piece, but they did not give you a model form or, you know, way to can, uh, gather uh, documentation for that review of the application. They said, you guys, agents, brokers, figure it out. And we here at Action, we, we've helped you figure that out, right? We have some forms we can provide to you if you're interested in using so or just uh, seeing what's available to you. Um, but what they are, what they do want to do in contract year 2026 is update that model consent form to also be dual purpose and give you uh, an opportunity to uh, collect that review of application documentation on that same form. So you have one piece of paperwork for your clients. Great improvement in a lot of people's eyes. The other thing they want to do is because they are very clear to specify that both consent and review. Uh, they don't have to be taken via paper form like this. It could be via a recording, right? If you do a lot of your business uh, uh, via phone or otherwise, you can collect consent and uh, documentation of uh, that consumers review the application that way. They also may add call scripts uh, to support both ends of that conversation. 
to really kind of reflect a multitude of ways that you might be engaging with your consumers. Uh, so they have this consent rule in place, again, to kind of help protect against bad actors and people stealing clients from, uh, from each other unbeknownst to the client or unbeknownst to the agent. And they're giving you more tools to stay compliant with those new uh, demands as well. The third thing you can do, or the third thing I think agents want to be aware of within this proposed rule is eligibility appeals. So right now on the marketplace, uh, active enrollees on the marketplace or on the federal marketplace at least can call the marketplace and appoint you uh, to act on their behalf in the marketplace. You can call uh, the marketplace call center and do some things with and for them. But right now, as it stands, you as the application filer, as the agent, cannot appeal eligibility, right? So if the marketplace comes back and says, nope, this person actually isn't eligible for coverage, it's the consumer that needs to file that appeal at the moment, not you. Uh, what this uh, proposed rule does is gives you as the agent, or uh, we should also point out uh, assisters and navigators as well would also have this ability. Anyone who helps file the application with the consumer or for the consumer would have the ability to also help them appeal eligibility uh, so long as the consumer has appointed them to do so. Again, makes it a little bit easier for consumers to access coverage here uh, and really gives you another way to service your clients and add to your own books going forward. So again, uh, a great positive here, I think in a lot, lot of folks' eyes as well. That said, Chelsea and I have been talking for a few moments here. We talked about three big changes that could impact your business. We'd like to know which of these seems most impactful to you. Go ahead. Um, some folks are saying, I uh, came out and said right away that thank you CMS and how often do you say that? Uh, but thank you CMS for cracking down and you know providing some uh, enforcement actions and guidance on those people stealing your you know clients and and and, and uh, making improper plan switches. Stephen comes out and says uh, you know like the updates the consent review form that's a welcome change from his part from his view. Lots of good things to like at least as a far as what directly impacts you as agent and brokers. Chelsea, anything to add before we uh, go and talk about what consumers will feel from this rule? It just feels like Marketplace is kind of following the lead of Medicare changes, right? Because we, it, I remember when I first started, it was when the call recording stuff came out and now they're saying, oh, well, we're going to write a script for you you can use for your consent stuff. I'm like, no, that sounds familiar. <laughs> like, this sounds like something we might have heard before. Yeah. Yeah, uh, in some ways, what's old is new again, right? And the consent form is like kind of in the same vein of an SOA, but not really. Yeah, there's there's a lot of parallels to be drawn here, but maybe in some ways that makes business easy a little bit easier, right? You're always know you're trying to. There's something you got to do before you can work with the client, right? So it kind of streamlines streamlines your processes. or try to be really glass half full about you know adding more work to, to your plates. Uh, admittedly, so. Um, but hopefully, you know, it, it also does some protect you, both your, your clients and protects your business going forward here. I was going to well. say, it probably helps your client feel a little safer, like when they have something in front of them, right? When you start working with them, like, hey, this is, this is all, this is all gravy. We all have it all under control. Just sign this for me. And that yeah, makes it feel safer. Yep. Yep. Speaking of clients and consumers, there are a few things in this rule that your consumers will directly feel. Want to spend the next few moments talking a bit about those. First thing is, is uh, they want to make some adjustments to grace periods and terminations and when plans will have the ability to either put folks into that grace period time um, and when plans will have the ability to terminate uh, people for non-payment. And in the rule, they presented two options and asked uh, some stakeholders to provide some feedback on these two options. Really what's happening in, at least to hear the marketplace tell it, um, in a lot of cases where people have very low monthly premiums because they have, you know, heavily uh, subsidized advanced premium tax credits, what happens is, is they have these one, two dollar, three, uh, three dollar balances, these ten dollar balances, maybe fifteen dollar balances from month to month uh, that don't get paid, right? Or they only pay a portion of that uh, balance and. In the scheme of things, that ten, that fifteen dollars in the insurer's eyes, in CMS's eyes, 
probably doesn't make a lot of money in their ability or doesn't make a lot of difference, right? In terms of their ability to cover medical claims and hurt, hurt their MLR. So in CMS's eyes for these small balances and these small balances only from month to month, what they're looking at are ways to uh, help consumers maintain coverage when they only have these small balances uh, that they might be due from month to month here. Premium balances to be clear, not uh, but balances they might have with any provider or with any deductible or things like that. And so what they're proposing is two different options. The first option is that fixed dollar threshold. And so what that would allow insurers to do is to set a specific threshold at which they begin penalizing consumers and move, in, move them into the grace period. They give some examples in the rule of $5 or less. So if someone owes the carrier less than $5, uh, at the end of the month or the end, end of a several months, depending on the size of their premium, right? They wouldn't be, t t uh, you know, turned over into the grace period and phase termination. Uh, but as soon as they cross that $5 threshold, for example, then they'd be subject to the grace period and termination. The other option on the table I, that they wanted some feedback from carriers on is, would you accept a percentage threshold instead? So in other words, if a consumer is paid 99% of their premium for the month or is, or is up to date with that, <laughs> but they've got 1% of that premium left over uh, or 2% or of that premium left over, uh, is that something you'd pe penalize? And again, we're looking at small balances, either 1% of premium or $5 or less. Uh, you know, If I talk about those bullet points backwards, but really the idea is they wanna make it easier for lower income consumers who are already uh, kind of on that threshold of Medicaid, Medicare eligibility, and who have substantial premium tax credits, they want to make sure they can keep coverage. So they're what, trying to reduce uh, the, the ways in which and the times in which they, those folks can hit grace periods or terminations for these small $5 or so debts. Second thing they want to do, and this applies more to states with state-based marketplaces, which is relevant to us because uh, some uh, bills have made our way through the state legislature to convert us to a state-based marketplace. Uh, we'll have to see, we'll be track those for you going forward. But in many states with state-based marketplaces, what's happening is uh, often the state does not notify the consumer that they have not filed their taxes or their uh, reconciliation. So the state never notifies or never gives prop, prop notification in CMS's eyes uh, that premium tax credits may be in jeopardy, right? Because the consumer didn't meet that file and reconcile requirement. Uh, state marketplaces uh, apparently are getting fairly sloppy about that. So last year, CMS did require all states, all marketplaces, whether it's federal or state, to provide a, a notice after that first year the consumer failed to file and reconcile. This year, CMS extends that window to two years, and after the second year of not filing or reconciling, then the consumer's premium tax credits would be at risk should this rule go into effect as written. Although I am sure the next administration and some other folks may have something to say about that here as well. And that's the other thing I think we have to keep in mind going forward is one administration proposed this rule. Another presidential administration is going to uh, finalize this rule. Same thing is going to be true in the Medicare markets as well. So we will uh, do our best to keep on track of what's changing between now and then uh, for you as well. The other thing consumers are going to directly feel is uh, a process called silver loading. And in 2017, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services was directed by the, the, the administration at the time to stop reimbursing carriers for cost sharing reductions on silver plans. So before, so between 2014, 2017, when um, <laughs> You know, we're looking at the uh, at cost share reduction, silver plan, so on and so forth. HHS was actually paying those CSRs. They were paying the deductibles, so on and so forth for those enrollees. They've since been directed to, to stop doing so since 2017. And what uh, insurers, what states rather have allowed insurers to do in lieu of that money from HHS is to uh, load their silver premiums, right? So they actually raise their silver premiums a bit more than a trend or anything else would suggest 
to make up for the money they're not getting from HHS in terms of paying for those cost sharing re reimbursements. So I'm talking about, you know, your uh, beneficiaries with less than 250% income of FPL who are seeing things like reduced deductibles, reduced copays, and so on and so forth on their plans. Um, what CMS does in this rule here is says, yeah, actually states that's totally okay. Uh, we understand that you as carriers need to make yourselves whole, right? The money to pay for that care needs to come from somewhere. So if you're loading premiums on non-cost sharing reduction silver plans to set up for what you're losing on, uh, you know, essentially covering people with cost sharing reductions, that's totally okay. You can keep doing that in our eyes and no one's going to uh, bet an eye at it. So how that impacts your consumers, especially those who might choose a silver plan without cost sharing reductions, is their premiums may continue to be a bit higher than they otherwise would were HHS uh, reimbursing plans for those costs. Um, so, of course, uh, a little bit, that's the, the kind of the big things, the, the kind of the kitchen table things your consumers might feel, even though they don't know why their premiums might be increasing sometimes. Uh, for you, agents and brokers, would like to get your ideas of what seems most impactful to your clients, go ahead and put a few words in the chat for us here. And Chelsea, we'd love to hear anything that you have on your mind as well. I'm just glad we're doing more to eliminate some of that churn, because it seems like that, um, Silver loading, or not silver loading, the um, having it so the less people that don't get kicked off as quickly um, when they don't pay or have a small balance left over when they're not paying on time. It feels like that would just be something you could just pay and move forward with, and it would be something the person would eventually pay. So it's like, why make more work for everyone and just let them have that little bit of more grace period um, so we don't have to do all this churn work really, like we did to do with the Medicaid um, unwinding a little while back there. Yeah, and that's a, a great point, especially from a servi per, uh, servicing perspective uh, as agents, right? As you have these folks with lots of, or huge premium tax credits, huge subsidies to help pay for their premiums, um, they and they have currently been, been terminated for these relatively small balances. That's more work on your end, right? Trying to try and find a short-term plan to, to hold them over till next open enrollment because uh, losing coverage for non-payment doesn't grant them an s &P, right? Uh, so from a lot of agents that, you know, we've heard you guys talk about this rule, they see that as a welcome change. Uh, and yeah, where, where we can reduce churn, it makes everyone's lives a little bit easier, including your clients. So with those first few things we talked about was what directly impacts you or what directly impacts your clients. There's also some things that are going to be happening behind the scenes a little bit that are going to impact the broader market. First thing is uh, CMS has been asked for years to take a look at these instances where new carriers come into mark come into markets, mark marketplace markets to be more precise, and they're offering bottom dollar premium as uh, bronze plans or bottom dollar bottom dollar premium silver plans. And then they immediately go bankrupt, leaving all those care, leaving all their subscribers without coverage because they don't actually have the income, the capital to pay for the claims, or so on and so forth. I, I'm not going to name and shame anyone publicly, but you have likely heard of those folks, uh, you know, withdrawing from Michigan mid-year or from other mark states you might be working in mid-year. CMS has heard your cries, has heard hospitals' cries, has heard consumers' cries, and says, "Yes, this is the year we're going to do something about it." So what they're going to do is take a look at two measures of insurers' financial health. What they're going to look at, the first thing they're going to look at is what's called their quick ratio. Um, the quick ratio measures how quickly, right, go figure, uh, the insurer can access their near cash reserves to me immediately cover their, what they're currently liable for. So if they have a bunch of claims, right, that they need to pay in February, right, do they have near cash reserves? So in credit, in stocks and, and things that they can liquidate to help pay for those claims. They also want to take a look at their risk-based capital, right? So what capital, what liquid capital will do insurers have on hand uh, to be able to pay to cover the risk that they have on the books? 
So looking at those two tests, a test rather, a test of liquid capital and a test of near liquid capital that they can use um, to pay for any liabilities they might have. And what they're going to uh, propose to do here is when they take a look at those carriers and their financial health, especially these newer carriers breaking into a market for the first time, uh, if they're, they don't meet those tests or they're, they're kind of on the borderline of whether they could be solvent or not, CMS may move to cap the enrollment in the plans that appear to be financially at risk. Um, so CMS might well say to these brand new plans, look, we're not in love with the, your financials at the moment. We're going to unlet, only let you enroll 5,000 people this year because uh, we want to make sure that there's li you know, this little disruption to the market as possible. For a lot of folks, this is good news um, because, again, it kind of helps to stabilize the market in some ways and make sure that your clients don't get left uncovered uh, mid-year due to you know, a carrier folding or leaving the market. Uh, one thing that also happens kind of casually throughout all the rulemaking is the risk adjustment model, model gets updated. The risk adjustment mo model is how CMS uh, chooses to reimburse and, and engage in uh, rating here. They take a look at, you know, carries books of business, how sick pe people are, so on and so forth, and, and create reimbursement plans on that. Um, what we should note here and what you'll probably feel a little bit in some premiums this year is two things. First of all is PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis is now going to be included in those child and adult, child and adult risk models. So that, that, that pre-HIV treatment or preventive HIV treatment is now going to be included in the pricing of those models. So you could see that drive premiums up in addition to everything else that drives premiums up year over year. Um, the other thing that will, may drive premiums down a little bit, there'll be some downward pressure, even though we'll probably see net, you're going to see net increases overall, is that uh, hepatitis C drugs is going to be brought, used to have their own carve out, right? They, they wanted to kind of give carriers an incentive to provide coverage for those drugs. Coverage for hepatitis C drugs is now going to be brought more in line with other drugs um, in order to you know, kind of give, put some downward pressure on premiums there as well. The other thing we should note um, is that all states currently do use that CMS's risk adjustment model. The ACA, the Affordable Care Act, does give the state to all states the option to create their own risk adjustment and reimbursement models. Uh, none of them have yet taken that, uh, that opportunity yet. <laughs> But what CMS does do is they charge states, even the District of Columbia, for using their risk adjust adjustment model, uh, something at 18 cents per member per month for 2026. Um, so there, there's a little bit more upward pressure there because they're, they may raise that rate going forward in 2026. The other thing that you probably you may not know, and it's a little more shows you how the sausage is being made in the background here, is that for states that do use healthcare.gov, whether as their marketplace solution or just for the enrollment, that federal partnership they, please, uh, they are increasing, uh, healthcare.gov is increasing its user fees to either two and a half or two and a, or two percent of premiums respectively. Um, and we know that carriers aren't going to absorb <laughs> that cost of doing business. They're going to pass that on in, in premiums going forward here as well. So that could create some additional upward pressure on premiums going into a contract year 2026 as well. Chelsea, I know you had a few more words to say about this one too. I never thought that the um, subsidies would affect so many things that I didn't even think were connected. It never, I, I, I'm glad you made that comment about the sausage being made because I never, ever, ever thought about how you know, subsidies going away might change how much the fees might be for the carriers to use the marketplace, which then might up the premium. Like, who thinks that? Like, that's crazy. And it, I'm, I never thought that we would have to be like holding our breath so much on one thing that would change so much about the rest of the trajectory of next year when it comes to um, premiums and prices of things. Because didn't even I knew that carriers would be taking into account whether or not those subsidies would be in effect when they're making the plans. But like, who knew these nitty gritty details would be affected by something like that too. I really hope they make the decision soon. I'm on my edge of my seat here. Yeah. 
Uh, and what Chelsea's alluding to there is the fact that the extend, expanded uh, premium subsidies that were put in place by the uh, American Rescue Plan and kind of lengthened through 2025 by the Inflation Reduction Act uh, are set to expire at the end of 2025. And if those subs expanded subsidies rather do expire, uh, CMS does note that the, the user uh, rate fee increase here, as well as this uh, the risk adjustment model user fees could increase, right? Because they need to cover their, uh, their cost of doing business, so to speak. Um, so without those additional subsidies in place, uh, there is risk that, you know, not only do consumers lose subsidies, but their core premiums could go up because CMS is charging additional dollars here as well. Uh, oh, what a wicked web we weave when we try to uh, make a marketplace insurance program. Next thing I want to talk about is provider network standards. Um, one thing CF CMS wants to look at is, especially for state-based marketplaces or states that do their own plan management functions, they want to take a look um, at whether or not those states are ensuring uh, network standards for those states. And what they're looking at is, do those plans that are uh, serving as qualified health plans in those states, do they have enough essential community providers? And those are folks who, are, who serve low income, medically needy individuals in their network. Uh, so do they have enough folks who would, you know, who work in these areas of lower so, social economic status and, you know, would be able to meet time and distance st standards to meet the folks who would also be eligible for cost sharing reductions or for significant premium tax credit sa uh, savings. So again, uh, additional looks and scrutiny coming toward provider networks and making sure uh, that all those standards are being met, especially with state-based marketplaces. The other thing we should talk about, a little bit about, um, if you happen to work in Minnesota or Oregon, they're the only two states that have a basic health program under the Affordable Care Act. And under these programs, does those states provide coverage who do, uh, to people who do not qualify for Medicaid or CHIP and have income between 133% and 200% of FPL. Uh, those plans also include at least 10, uh, the 10 essential health benefits and their premiums and cost sharing cannot exceed what enrollers would pay on the marketplace. So essentially it's a, it's a public option available in those states. Um, what is going to happen for those states going forward is that states, these two states, Minnesota and Oregon, would receive funding equal to 95% of the premium tax credits and CSRs uh, that folks would have been eligible with had they enrolled on a marketplace plan offered by an insurer. So they're making funding for those basic health programs a bit easier to go forward. Um, so real quick note here before we wrap up, we, we're not here for a long time today, just a good one. Out of all the things we've talked about here today, is there anything that's like super important to you? Which of those trends would you like Chelsea Action and I to keep track of uh, when that final rule is published? Like what is going to get you to open that email or come to a webinar? What are you most interested out of everything you've heard today? Please go ahead and put a few notes in the chat. Chelsea would love to hear from you as well before we wrap up. This is my favorite part. I always want to know what agents want to know more about because I know I get it. I get just super interested in one thing. And I'm like, huh, agents must also be super interested in this. And then turns out, oh, they really want to hear about something else. I'm like, so please let us know. But uh, I mean, I, I guess I'm just fixated on those subsidies. I really want, I can't wait to see if those subsidies are going to shake out or not. Um, you know, if you asked me a few months ago, like I was like, oh yeah, no problem. It's just whenever they get around to saying yes. And now just now, the, now that I see how much it's going to be affected by that, and if they are really put to the wayside, I'm like, what is going to happen, man? Um, we'll still be there. We're still we're still be shut selling. We'll still be helping you at the end of the day. But what will that look like? Yeah, lots of uncertainty going forward. Some folks saying that you know they want to keep abreast on uh, the compliance updates, right, with the uh, consent review forms and what comes out there. Well, we're happy to you know get those in your inbox. And if you don't already have a solution for those, or at least a solution you. We absolutely love for those. Let us know. Uh, we have some things in our library. We can even stylize for them, uh, them for you. Put your brand on them going forward. Happy to help you out with that. Um, other folks saying that they they are kind of curious about, uh, you know, 
those those grace periods, right? Because they do work in markets where they have consumers who are eligible for lots of uh, premium tax credit. And I want to see how those will be effective going forward uh, should subsidies remain intact. All that said, folks, I want to thank you for your time and attention here today. If there's three things you need to remember from today, it's that CMS is good. I was proposing to strengthen their fraud monitoring for agents and crack down on that going forward. They are proposing some updates to better uh, protect consumers, especially those lower income consumers that we talked about and give some flexibility to them as well. And generally the way that we're reading this rule is they're trying to balance both consumer and insurer interest to enhance marketplace stability. They don't wanna see consumer churn and they certainly don't wanna see carrier churn as carriers, you know, drop out of the market because they all of a sudden become insolvent. Five, um, Chelsea, before we say goodbye to the people, what else do they need to know? I would just say, man, I, I hate to toot our own horns here, but it, I would stay, I would keep on our trading calendar. Um, man, if you could see the two of us refreshing our mailboxes every few minutes to try to get some more clarity on rules and stuff, because we just want to tell you guys stuff, um, you would laugh at us because of how often we're doing it. But, um, yeah, if you want to be abreast of the stuff, if you want to be in the know, keep your eyes on the training calendar. We've got a bunch of stuff planned for you for the rest of December um, for future proofing your business. And hope, and man, once CMS gets those rules out, <laughs> we'll tell you about those uh, those rules for Medicare. Um, and I know if you're a big of a rule nerd as me, then you're going to be as interested in it as I am. So, I mean, if you're in this webinar, you probably will be. So keep an eye out for that. And um, happy OEP and happy AEP if you celebrate that too. <laughs> Speaking of OEP and AEP, should you need any help, our nine-person individual team is always here for you here as well. Happy to help you process applications, answer any questions you have. Would love uh, for them to be helping you and love, would love for you to take advantage of them at absolutely no cost. All that said, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time and attention here today. Always love spending time with you all here. Uh, on behalf of Chelsea and everyone here at Action Benefits, I do wish you a successful OEP and look forward to seeing you all again soon at another Action Academy session. Please enjoy your days.